All right. We are talking mindfulness on our episode today. And more importantly, how you can quantify if you're becoming more mindful or not, which I haven't heard anybody talking about. And of course, it's coming from Dr. Reiner Kraft. He's a seasoned technology leader, engineer, scientist, technical advisor, trainer, um, executive leader, micronutrients expert, human potential coach, and teacher who shares transformative principles of presence, mind management, and biohacking using the latest science of epigenetics genetics. So we've got a engineer brain on mindfulness. Super cool. Um, Reiner is tuning in from Germany and, um, yeah, he's just incredible. I it's, it's really cool because I practice a lot of mindfulness. Um, I'm, a, I'm, I'm pretty into that stuff. I don't know if I've really talked that much about it on the show, but, um, just being out of the thinking mind, being fully present in the moment. Um, and that's what he's talking about. But what he's done is he's, you know, taken his engineer brain. He used to work in Silicon Valley and tech and work for Yahoo and all of these things. And when he got into mindfulness for his own stress reduction, health optimization, he, you know, if you're an engineer type brain, you will definitely resonate with him on this episode because he's like, okay, yeah, but like, how do we actually measure how do we know if we've improved? You know, how do we like kind of break this down and create a system for success and, and a measuring system? And it, it, you'll see in the episode, I was like, it kind of reminds me of when you have to, when you're relearning how to eat because you've learned really unhealthy patterns, tracking your food can actually be a really helpful to, tool to find out why you're getting the results that you're getting, right? And then you don't have to do it forever. And that's how he is with this. And it's just really cool. Um, he's talking about, um, neurofeedback. He's talking about using technology in a way to help us versus being completely opposed to it, you know? So yeah, he's just wonderful. I think you guys are going to really enjoy this episode. This is uh, Dr. Reiner Kraft, and you can find him on Instagram as at the mindful leader and his website is the mindful leader.net. All right, let's dive in. Okay. So the mindful leader I told you before we started, I'm excited to have this conversation because I think we're going to resonate on a lot of things. It seems like we have walked a similar path of understanding the importance of presence, the importance of connecting to yourself, uh, source, God, whatever people want to call it, higher self, what it's that having that connectedness on a soul level, and then also having your body aligned so that you can feel that, uh, be connected that way more. I'm excited to kind of dive into this. So can you tell us how you got here? Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Tara, for having me here on this show, on the episode. Um, yeah, I mean, I got into um, a lot of those topics around awareness, becoming more aware, um, becoming also more aware of the mind, what's going on in the mind, what is the mindset the the notion of the egoic mind or in general things that as a background as my background is in computer science and I'm a computer scientist I like to talk about the software that runs the mind operating system sometimes I use this term um, then there's the body as well so talking about uh, how to upgrade the body so those are all things over the years that for me uh, resonated and where I got deeper and deeper mm. into it mostly uh, to be honest initially from a, from my own <laughs> interest in yeah. uh, feeling managing stress uh, this was for me a big topic about probably more than 10 12 years ago now as I spent most of my time in the Silicon Valley in California and so there was a lot of stress and yeah. um, caught caught up with me and then I had to figure out oh man now what do you do how do you yeah how do you get out of out of this into a more balanced state of mind and then uh, I eventually did but there was also then so the body wasn't in good shape so what do you do now and needless to say when uh, I went to standard traditional school medicine doctors because I, I didn't know anything else existed Mm -hmm. they uh, gave me some pills and medicine for all kinds of things I had like high blood pressure and uh, arrhythmias and, and uh, anxiety attacks and all the stuff <laughs> the good stuff 
And then I took this uh, uh, medication, things got relatively quickly worse because a lot of the side effects that were listed on the package of those drugs, they, uh, yeah, they obviously appeared then. And then I figured, man, there has to be better, smarter way of yeah. getting healthier. And that's why this was, from a personal interest, it's very interesting um, self-interest, right? To, to to live healthier, to live more peaceful, live more balanced. And that's what got, got me into this. And then over 10, 15 years, eventually things evolved. And I, yeah, during this journey, I learned a lot and was able to uh, really upgrade pretty much everything. <laughs> and so that's why I'm happy. And now I'm, for many years now, also I'm helping others to live more more balanced, to live more, uh, become more aware, to upgrade mind and body pretty much. Um, that's how it evolved. Well, I appreciate you um, coming up rising up and taking a seat at the table because we need a lot of voices because unfortunately what you described of people literally don't know that like holistic health, health optimization, they don't know this world exists. There's a lot of people like I have a pain. I go to the regular Western medicine doctor and I always tell people, I'm like, we have a lack of education about what they do and don't do. (laughs) We have a lot. It's like Western medicine to me is like, you're going to get either a medicine, a medication, a pharmaceutical medication or surgery is pretty much the two paths that they can provide. But it's like, if you want to get to the root, why do you have high blood pressure? Why do you have pain in your stomach? Why is this happening? You know, that's our world. (laughs) That's functional health. That's holistic health. And so it's like, there's still, I'd say most people don't know that there's like this whole other avenue that you can take. And on top of it, it's, it isn't just the, you know, you have gut issues. It's not just physiological. It's also your mindset, how you're seeing life, how you're responding to stress. Do you have enough self-worth to just sit in nature and silence and enjoy? Or does that make you anxious because you still are operating out of this program of, I have to do, I have to achieve, I have to go, go, go in order to matter, you know? And so um, I'm very interested in your your position coming from Silicon Valley, coming from, you know, I, I meet some of these guys sometimes and I can see they have brilliant minds. So they really like to be in their minds because their minds are cool. Their minds is like are quick and smart and strategic and can solve problems and can see things other people can't see. And so I've noticed um, kind of in the, the engineer brain is like what I like to call them. They really enjoy being in their minds and there's nothing wrong with being in your mind. But if you don't understand how, I mean, none of us fully understand how it works, but if you don't, you know, you're not aware of what's going on, how the operating system is operating, you can become stuck in a lot of patterns and have no idea what's going on. And so I would love to hear your perspective. You talk about the monkey mind a lot and and understanding how our minds work. So could you share with us some of the things that you've learned? Yeah, sure. It's basically my, my learnings initially were when I started exploring mindfulness, I had no clue what that is. And I took this eight-week meditation class, MBSR, Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction. It's, and mm. I, I, it's like a standard standard uh, course, globally available all over the world. And that's what that was my first experience with mindfulness. And for me, this was a strange thing, sitting still and uh, doing a body scan. So what? And, but... I was open at that point. I um, I had some shift. Definitely felt there was some shift in awareness happening at that point, which mm-hmm. triggered me to mm-hmm. even do this or consider it. Because before that, I was exactly like this uh, in the Silicon Valley, pretty much the mind thinking all the time, innovating, coming up with ideas, and doing, of course, a lot of programming and, and hacking, so to speak, software systems. Mm-hmm. And when I, uh, that was the time I was still at Yahoo and the uh, they actually offered this program. So I'm still thankful for, uh, to them for making this available. And then I, I 
during the class, I, I realized some, yeah, there is there was something there. This is pretty cool stuff. It's I still didn't know how to where to put all these things and and how to um, yeah how to rationalize things as well because as a scientist I like to see mm -hmm. uh, numbers, data, and so on. And now I sit there and I meditate, and then uh, how do I know this is working? Am I meditating right? Is there some progress? And so on. So the mind was still asking this question. Yeah. But at the end, this was all about awareness. And then later, when I increased my awareness, I, I also refer to this now, your level of present awareness, your LPA, which is the percentage of the day, you're fully present and connected with the present moment. And so that's why this LPA is a nice number to, to look at awareness. And this was something also I it, it evolved, right? When I asked myself the question, how aware are you? But then when awareness was actually increasing, I, I was able to observe the mind and notice that this is quite a chaos in, mm -hmm. in a sense that there is, uh, and this is my analogy, usually I talk about the mind software, the mind operating system, mind OS, um, because that is really what it is. It, it is this complex and buggy software that's running on your brain, which is the hardware. And this operating system, the mind operating system, runs also a lot of different apps, right? And these apps, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> they're also mostly if the if the if the mind is not in a trained state, they also can be quite buggy. Um, they could be quite big energy wasters or energy suckers, and they could mm -hmm. cause stress. Some of them. Mm. Talking about if you think about apps like things like reactive patterns, limiting thoughts, so a lot of this reactive, yeah, things that you automatically conditioned to to respond in certain situations, right? and these are all basically apps. And mm -hmm. that analogy for me then was helpful to think about the mind as something. Well, if it's software, it can be hacked. It can be optimized. Let's figure out how to do that. And mm. then, of course, at the end, I also then thought about eventually also about the body. And once I got deeper into the science of uh, epigenetics, I realized that the body is actually the same way. <laughs> it's basically your DNA, your genes, it's the blueprint, which uh, is something, it's the bits, the bytes, basically, that makes out the information. But the software there is really epigenetics, right? When the epigenome that allows me to tweak the expressions of these genes. And so that was a, also a profound insight. So that at the end of the day, I figured out well, there is the mind, this big software thingy with all these apps that can be hacked and optimized. And then there is the body, which at the end of the day, also there is software that can, can be optimized. And the question was how, right? And then it was clear that over the years, then when I was experimenting, hacking the mind and the body, the big question always then was, there's so many methods out there that you can try, mm -hmm. diets, different meditations, whatever. But the question was always, how do I know this is working? And so that got me into more a, of a data-driven approach to mindfulness, to awareness, to the mind, to the body. Because as computer scientists and many business professionals in business, this is a standard thing that if you work in a company setup that you know how to deal with data and with numbers and you do it. If you would run a project nowadays without any numbers and KPIs, key performance indicators, you wouldn't last long in this business context. And so I figured this is a default behavior because it delivers results. And so I, I figured I need to apply the same rigor mm. to myself, to awareness, to mind and body. And this is where basically this idea of a data-driven approach to those areas of awareness, mindfulness, uh, pretty much evolved over the years. Mm. And then, uh, yeah, I experimented and they deliver results. That's for sure, basically. Mm. I, I, um, 
I love like engineer brain people because they come up with a lot of solutions that other people just are kind of a little more okay with gray area. A lot of people, but like, if you have an engineer type brain, you're like, no, we need clarity here, like some more clarity. And so that, that gift that, you know, that, um, way of thinking brings a lot of information that can be very helpful for people, especially those who some people I think are put off by mindfulness, meditation, silence, presence, because they're like, what is the point? And especially if you're this kind of brain, it's, it's wired for efficiency. So, uh, you know, I, I do some testing with my clients where, um, we use personality to determine, um, uh, which neurotransmitters they might be higher in. Right. And because it will impact your, your personality quite a bit. And it's the, the, these dopamine dominant or dopamine sensitive is probably a better way to put it. People, if they, if something doesn't make sense, they lose interest, right? Because they are wired for efficiency. It's like, why would we go that way if it doesn't make sense? And so sometimes these messages of here's some data, here's something you can latch onto that shows and makes sense. It, it's an entry point for a, a lot of people who are wired that way to be like, oh, okay, I just needed this to make sense because otherwise, if it feels like a waste of my time, I'm definitely not doing it, right? And so what is, um? I love this analogy of the apps running, very good. I love that. And like these old outdated apps that are just sucking your battery and they're not, they're actually making everything harder, not easier. So, um, what is, you know, you talk about this, the data that you've collected, you know, what are some of the findings that you've had in terms of, you know, this monkey mind, the body epigenetics, could you share a little more in depth with us? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, the for each of these areas, the journey was to over time figure out what metrics make a lot of sense, which are helpful to figure out where you are in terms of a certain state. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, also in terms of obtaining a baseline of how to make progress, but you can see that this is actually doing something in a positive way or maybe not. And so that was actually the the more difficult part to figure yeah. it out, right? Figuring out how do you measure your mind? Yeah. Awareness. And then the body, even of course, there's so many markers out there in terms of lab work that you can do um, for all for all kinds of systems in the body. And then there's all these different genes and variant SNPs and so on. Mm -hmm. that you can think about, uh, so I think there is no shortage there on the body, relatively uh, speaking, that from all those different hundreds of different blood markers, of course, there will be, it's clear that over time, some of them based on science can figure out have a stronger impact. If the goal, for instance, is living more healthy, anti-aging, longevity, mm -hmm. and so that part was also difficult uh, to figure out which markers to look for. Mm -hmm. Then I think the mind was the more interesting thing, to be honest, to figure out how aware am I um, and how, yeah, yeah, going on in my mind and how are these different states like these apps, how mm -hmm. do I know they're actually uh, getting better? And so I think that was the interesting part and that was something where i got over over the years i got more and more insights mm. and then gradually um, it became um, yeah i came up with some standard set of metrics which then i started using of course initially for myself but then when i created i founded my own business a few years back the mindful leader where I started working with many executives, tech leaders, business product leaders who were interested in achieving a higher state of awareness, becoming mm -hmm. more efficient in their thinking, and also, yeah, more energy, more resilience. And then the beauty there was that these people usually, they like data. For them, yeah. it's, not, it's nothing that is uh, strange. Right. So, they like data and therefore this approach there resonated very well. Yeah. Learning curve because I had to teach them initially what all these metrics are, how to evaluate and how to do all that stuff. Mm. And years, I think last was last year then 
when people ask me, I want to do this effectively, how can I do this in a few months? And for me to scale, I figured out I had to somehow make this available in some form that people can just access it, read it, uh, apply it. And so I created my own uh, training platform, mindfultechleaders.com, mm. where I then put all those things together in something called a high performance mind program. Mm. I started having people going through this because I wanted to see if this is actually working. And yeah, I mean, there was <laughs> people definitely uh, mentioned as feedback later. This was, there was a steep learning curve. It's like taking one of those <laughs> harder university classes, right? That usually are not that pleasant, but mm. they did results, right? And the program is similar. It's, there is a lot of work. Co- there is work component in there, a lot of learning. But if people actually understand the measurement methodology, and at the end, it doesn't matter what methods you use, right? For all those different things, there's so many different methods out there, different diets, different meditation styles, different right. exercises, sports, whatever. There's so many different things out there that you can try. But once they understood how to evaluate these things, that's basically where they can then determine which methods they pick mm. because they're all different some people like this some other one likes this and so i think this is where the, the power comes in here is that there's you can choose whatever you like but if it actually works let's measure it and find out yeah yeah that's the engineer mind and I, I love it right it's like well, let's find out if it actually works <laughs> Um, so like, is this like in your, your level of, um, present self-awareness, your LPA, is it like a scale that there's certain questions that you answer and, and rate where you're at to find out, you know, is that kind of how it works or how do you measure? Yeah. Good question. The, the LPA level of present awareness, it's actually based on real data. So it's based on how many minutes per day are you actually present, fully present? Mm. So the unit there are mindful minutes. And many of the apps nowadays on your smartphone, there's a feature in there that they actually count mindful minutes. Oh, cool. Let's say you do meditation or you do some Mm. training exercise and they count mindful minutes. Mm. And so the tracking there for you can start leveraging some of these apps to tell you in the evening how many mindful minutes did I have, then you can divide this by the number of hours that you're awake, usually let's say 16 hours. Mm. And then uh, it's a percentage. So as an example, let's say you collected 20 mindful minutes and there is 16 hours is roughly 1000 minutes, make it simple. So then we're talking about 2%. Like, so your LPA is 2%. And that number is actually not that, at first it looks like very small, but this is like more like a default state that I encounter with many of the people I work with. In the beginning, usually a default LPA when people have not trained their mind yet is maybe 2%, 1%, 3%. So it's somewhere in this ballpark. And then the rest of the day, The rest of the 97, 98% is basically caught up in your thinking mind, autopilot, right? Thinking about the present, not the present, mostly the past, sometimes the future. It's also thinking, 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 right? And that is where results get generated like crazy, a big waste of energy, but Mm -hmm. during that time, you're not connected to the present moment. And so these 20 minutes, this is the baseline. And if you do this exercise, counting these mindful minutes over a few weeks, then it gets more stable because you get better at counting and then you actually arrive at some baseline. Mm. Maybe let's say it is 3% and then at least what you know, well, it's not much, but it's 3% that's a start. And a lot of those activities, currently this is where manual tracking kicks in because you can't track everything with an app, unfortunately. So give you an example, let's say simple exercises like brushing your teeth in the morning could be two minutes, but if you do it mindfully, if you pay attention, if you're aware, 
then you can actually collect two mindful minutes. The app wouldn't track that, right? but you could track it manually by mm -hmm. taking a note. You take a shower, you do it mindfully, you be fully present. So mm -hmm. things you're doing anyhow, like uh, the showering example, eating a meal, drinking a cup of coffee, walking the dog, right? petting your cat, whatever it is, these all are these are all things that are, that you're doing anyhow. And the idea is do them while being fully present. Yeah. Collect mindful minutes. And if you do this, usually I tell my uh, clients when I work with them, let's try to collect 30 mindful minutes per day just from these activities. See if you can do that. And that's a real challenge <laughs> for for many in the first few weeks of the program to actually collect these 30 mindful minutes because they always fall back to old habits. Then they complain, ah, oh, the tracking is so hard. It's too much work. And say, well, it is what it is. You have to do something. Otherwise, it's not going to work. And mm. so there's a lot of resistance. The mind doesn't like to be tracked. Right. The, right. Ego, the ego, the egoic mind, the way I refer to it is, does not like being dismantled, so to speak, because right. what you're doing is basically you, you take away the power, right? Because mm -hmm. if you become more and more aware, you realize uh, the mind is just, uh, or the ego is in many cases not that helpful. It produces all these garbage thoughts and it causes a lot of stress, sometimes mm -hmm. suffering, right? Mm -hmm. And that's that helpful and but you realize you become aware of it and that is the, the, the transformation trigger the trigger this change right and so that's why this methodology it works that well <laughs> because once you become aware of it once you start accounting in the measuring process you start keep tracking these mindful minutes you also keep tracking you can measure for instance your thoughts per minute mm. that data samples over the day wow. the Give you your thoughts per day, right? Wow. Did you so, say thoughts per minute? Yeah, thoughts per wow, minute. Wow, I love that. Those are interesting metrics to look wow. at. Right. Of course, you have to learn how to measure this. Right. Well, another one is called conscious recovery. So this is every time you start daydreaming, you fall, get identified with thoughts, you become aware of it. Mm. And you, ah, okay. So now I was gone again. Yeah. Because you write it down and you make a mindful minute out of it very good i like that so tracking these things you can now see this can become quite cumbersome at the beginning mm -hmm. there's a lot of manual work in there so you keep it doesn't have to be perfect but knowing okay how many mindful minutes was it this morning in the afternoon and you have to write it down and then in the evening reflect look at the total number and and the mind will find excuses not to do it and easily gets distracted. Mm -hmm. that, that is the real difficulty. So otherwise it wouldn't be that difficult, mm -hmm. but have the discipline to actually do it, not just talk about it, but actually do it, right? right. That is where the transformation kicks in with little things like this, because then what's happening is that the um, the mind over time realizes that it. It's not no longer basically a lot of this thinking activity is no longer needed. And yeah. then the mind is smart in a way that it gradually uh, decreases this level of noise. Yeah. And that's when you see all of a sudden that your thoughts per minute are actually starting to fall mm. until eventually the, the sweet spot is if they go down to zero. Then you're in a complete peaceful state in the present moment. Mm -hmm. No sort of activity anymore. We're just here, right? Just mm -hmm. present. And that is where the magic happens in the present moment. It's that simple. Yeah. Right? I love and, this. Okay, go ahead. This is the methodology that gets you there is the by data, right? It's numbers, mm -hmm. data, tracking. Mm -hmm. And obviously, once you get there and then you are, it stabilizes, it takes some time to stabilize the mind into state. Mm -hmm. um, but then you basically don't have to do the tracking anymore, right? At some point, the mind is so settled that it's no need; it's not needed anymore. 
at that point you can shift and you can still track some stuff. I'm not saying forget all about the tracking. I'm just saying a lot of the tracking that is a little bit more cumbersome than at that point can be eliminated. There's no need, it's not needed. And then uh mm. because at that point you're in a such uh, state of flow most of the time. Uh, stress is fading away, right? And you still can work on upgrading your software. There's always work to do. I think this is a never ending process. There's always something that you can let go of, people you can forgive, um, reactive patterns that you can dissolve. You still get trapped into some of those things, but so you can keep working on those, but they're not causing any stress anymore. It's just yeah. a little bit of activity, basically, right? Yeah, I know um, Eckhart Tolle says that um, the greatest addiction, in his opinion, the greatest addiction in humanity is the addiction to thinking. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm i a fan of um, Ram Dass and Alan Watts and these guys, and they talk a lot about these kinds of things. And um, one thing that Ram Dass says a lot is, you, you know, you are not your thoughts. And maybe you guys have heard, I don't know if you guys have heard that, but like for me, you know, it, talking about thinking of the space behind your thoughts is like what, you know, I, Buddhism, uh, maybe the yogis, you know, some of the spirit, uh, many, you know, I guess you could call them spiritual teachers. I don't even know if that's the right word. Um, mindfulness teachers, <laughs> consciousness teachers, they talk yeah. about this, this, this place of awareness behind thoughts. And I, to me, like, even though I've meditated pretty much every day, I hardly ever miss. I really look forward to it for about five years now. It's when it's only been, it's really only been this in the last six months for me that I've actually practiced what you are talking about actively of releasing the mind and being fully present. So I'm driving in silence I, a thought comes in, I let it go. Like, it's like, you know, it's not like I'm in meditation right now. I'm just learning to be mindful in my life. My kid comes in to talk to me. I'm looking them directly in the eyes. I'm not thinking anything. I'm just receiving, you know, or I'm watering plants and I'm just all I water is going in. I'm not thinking about it. I'm not distracted thinking about other things. And I can't even believe, I mean, I, I feel like I went through like another s stage of awakening from just actively practicing that. I already felt pretty intuitive, pretty tapped in those things, but releasing the mind and coming into presence. And you realize when you're actively releasing thoughts like that, you realize how much that, I mean, they're coming in like every second. It's just like a release. Oh, and now I'm thinking about that thing to say to my client. Oh, whoop, you know, and it's just this letting it go, letting it go. And I love that you're tracking that because I haven't really known how to put into words, uh, what I've been experiencing, but it's, you know, it's gotten me to the point personally that like, I'm more sensitive to light and sound. Um, I just overall, my level of awareness is I've become a lot more sensitive in this state. And it has felt like, um, yeah, it, it feels like I've reached a different level of consciousness from doing what you're teaching people to do. And so I was wondering if you could put in your, from your perspective, how would you describe like the actual, you know, like real life application of being in pure presence, you know, like, what does that feel like during the day? I, I did my best to describe it, but, you know, cause I don't think we talk about mindfulness, but it's like, I don't think very many people are actually doing it. You know, it's cause it's just the thinking mind is, you know, well, how would you describe mindfulness? Yeah, presence? That's, that's a good question. Let's see. So there's several things in there. So mindfulness itself, the way I think about it, is in the tool or is an enabler to cultivate consciousness growth, or awareness growth. So it's it's basically maybe it's considered an activity even, but I like the term more enabler. So we can be, become mindful. So maybe better to say become aware of. What you're doing in the present moment, maybe how you feel, what you sense in your body. There's so many things, or the sounds around you, noises, whatever it is. So becoming aware is 
actually the key thing. And mm. mindfulness then therefore is just, yeah, it's if you are mindful or if you're practicing mindfulness exercises, whatever it is, they help you to become more present. So this is basically what it boils down to, becoming more aware. Mm -hmm. And teachers like Eckhart, for instance, uh, yeah, I enjoy always having Eckhart talk about these things. Um, I like to listen to the teachings and everything makes all sense. But the problem with these teachings is that what I very early at the beginning realized is, <laughs> so sounds all good, but how do you do this? <laughs> yeah. And what is it? What, is the, what does the state even mean, right? How right. Do you, now this mindful state mean and how how do you get there and yeah um <laughs> well for me the, the question was okay let's put this more in practical terms yeah. like what does what is how does it feel if you're fully aware and those things you can practice very easily mm. that's why i said this exercise start brushing your teeth and actually be fully aware while you're doing it right and you all of a sudden you notice new things in your mouth, right? All of a sudden you feel your teeth, your gum. And so, oh, what is this? And you actually, right? now if you brush your teeth, you actually need more than two minutes. Usually, remember the dent dentist always will tell you you need two minutes. And if you're doing it on autopilot, usually you're done in 30 seconds. Right. And so when you actually become aware of what you're doing, it's a different quality of life in everything becoming more when you drink your coffee just people they just put in some milk and all this garbage in which is not healthy anyhow putting all this this milk uh, lactose usually people don't tolerate lactose very well right and so they're putting all this stuff in the coffee and then it completely dissolves the the taste right the taste is gone it just tastes like this creamy thingy whatever right but you can have any garbage coffee now and you put some cream in it and all of a sudden it tastes right. okay. So all right. But if you actually drink your coffee mindfully, being present, being fully there, mm -hmm. no stuff in it, then you can actually sense uh, the taste. Right. And you, you, re you realize, oh, this is actually, this This tastes good. Or maybe, oh, what is this garbage? Right, right. right. And so, and this is the quality of experience. Once you're fully aware, everything gets, yeah, it gets deeper. Everything yeah. that you that you experience gets deeper. Mm. That what that's what I would say when people ask, yeah, is it cool to be mindful or what's the benefit? I would say, I mean, an LPA of two percent, obviously you're missing out a lot on, on life. Yeah. yeah. You can, usually I try to get my clients from two percent of 10% LPA. Uh, so basically, uh, factor five, better a factor of 10 up to 20% of LPA. And then usually I ask them later after maybe it usually takes a few months, right, to, to get to this level. Of course, not everyone can do it. But those who can go through, they will usually share and say, man, this is my, my life is completely changed, right? I All of a sudden, I'm that calm. I, I have all these pleasant experience there's peace in my mind right so th there's a profound impact doing that mm -hmm. if you if you bump up your level of awareness from a factor of from two percent of 10 or 15 or so so it's yeah it's really <laughs> life changing right and of course imagine if you can bump it up even further yeah right? at some point it's usually i would say then the gains you get is usually not that uh, significant mm -hmm. but you get the big the big uh, result usually you get if you get from a from a low one two percent LPA up to maybe 15 20 percent right. right yeah that's going to be a, you're living a completely different life and a completely different consciousness I bet even two percent to four percent would be significant oh, yeah and and those those things you can get easily mm -hmm. but again you're working against your mind here this is the problem what <laughs> and I think if you listen to some of the the spiritual teachers they tell you about this that your ego becomes your your smartest enemy right <laughs> this is yeah, and that's actually the case because you will find excuses not to do it mm -hmm. you're, you're creative right you'll you'll find oh no and it's a, so you know exactly what to do so i usually tell them look put together a strategy for this day see how you can collect 30 mindful minutes 
and write it down so that you have a piece of paper, mm. write it down what your strategy is for the day. Mm. The idea would be okay, brushing your teeth, two minutes, taking right. a shower, 10 minutes, drinking a coffee, two minutes, having a meal, 15 minutes, right? And so on. Right. Boom, 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 boom. Right. And then you try to collect, let's say, 30, 40 of these uh, or 50 mindful minutes. That's the strategy. And then you look at it in the morning. So you remember, ah, yeah, this is what I need to do. And then the thing is, you have to execute on it, actually doing it, right? Yeah. And this is where basically the, the mind works against you because the mind is lazy, first of all. And the mind likes routines and the mind doesn't like to be conscious. Right? So it will work against you. It will sabotage you for sure. Mm -hmm. And then in the evening, you reflect, you look back. Ah, so I had this strategy. If you even reflect in the evening, the, may, the mind may even tell you, what a waste of time. Don't do journaling, reflection. What Rainer said, this is all garbage. Let's not do that. We'll, we'll have some beer and have some fun with some friends. That's it, right? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> the mind the mind will sabotage you. It's not a question if it will, but it will actually sabotage you. And the, the trick is being so aware that you realize in the moment when this is happening that the mind just plays another trick on you. And then falling back to your routines, which is looking at this list that you made in the morning. Say, so, okay, this was my list. So let's see, what did I do today? Did I brush my teeth mindfully? Mm, maybe not. <laughs> did I take a shower mindfully? Ah, maybe two minutes. Okay, that's the start. You, you collect your mindful minutes then in the evening. You look at it. And let's say you come back with 10, right? And say, well, oh, it's not that many. 10 mindful minutes, it's a little low. Um, but it is what it is. This is the reality. There were 10 mindful minutes. It's better than zero, right? And then being motivated and saying, great, so tomorrow is a new day. Let's start all over again. Let's see what I can do. And if you're persistent, right? If you're persistent, if you can do this for, uh, I think the magic number, as people usually say, it takes about, I don't know, 30 days to form a routine, but mm -hmm. some neuroscientists actually tell you it's more than 60 days. That's the sweet mm -hmm. spot. So if you can do something for 30 to 60 days anywhere okay. in between consistently, then it becomes a habit. Mm -hmm. Then you think about it anymore. And this is how you outsmart your mind is by, mm -hmm. by actually leveraging this mechanism that if something right. goes by that, you don't have to think about it anymore, right? Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I always like tell my clients, I'm like, if we had to, if it was just so easy to change our patterns, we would have to learn how to walk and talk every single day. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a reason that there, this efficiency thing is built in. But once you can repattern it with intention, you can you can use that to your advantage. This stuff's just going to start coming on autopilot, which is what I hear you saying. And it the the tracking thing is making me like giggle because as in nutrition. I've sat so much with like helping people make nutrition changes because I don't track all my food. I did before, you know, at one point I don't now. And it's kind of that same thing. It's like, you gotta learn what results you're getting from what, like at some point the awareness has to be enhanced. And of course, like everyone's like, Oh, it's so annoying to track my food. I went to this restaurant. I don't know. I'm like, just guess. Just guess, because right now we've got to get the habit of un being conscious of this is what I'm putting in and these are the results I'm getting. And then eventually you have the ropes and you can just do this thing like, you know, where I'm at now. But if you have no idea what's going in or why, you, what, you know, you, it, it tracking does increase awareness when you don't have a lot of awareness in a certain area of your life. Yeah. That's exactly how it works. I right? just, just doing the tracking in itself is doing the trick. Mm -hmm. if, and, uh, paying attention every time an excuse comes up, why not to do it, then ignore it. <laughs> it's just your mind. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing this uh, for a while, then um, usually the mind becomes more compliant. It becomes more quiet. And then you get down into the state, right, where thought activity drops maybe to one or two thoughts per minute. This is actually already pretty quiet, it's a peaceful state. And eventually you get down to zero, right? And what I mentioned earlier, and if you're at zero thoughts per minute, I mean, this is the state you want to be in. People also call it a flow state, an enlightened yeah. state. Yeah. If you 
use that term as well, right? It is it is a state of ultimate flow because there's no thinking anymore. You're just in the present moment. Yeah. You're doing what you're doing. You keep doing it, and there's no thought about it anymore. Right? And that's yeah. where the power lies. And this is the ultimate flow state. And if yeah. you know about, if you can keep in this flow state, let's say initially maybe not long, maybe for ten seconds, twenty seconds. But if thoughts per minute are going down to zero, by definition means that you're usually getting into multiple minutes of flow state. Mm. Ultimately, you can get into yeah, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour, right? Sometimes. And that's actually very pleasant because at that point, you don't care anymore if after an hour you get out of the flow state. Well, then, yeah, then there's a few thoughts, whatever, and then you get back into it again. Here we go. Right? And that's mm. the end. The end result is that you're completely in this in this state, in your daily routines, right? Not just in a meditative state. Right, right. Like usually, of course, I teach people also at some point uh, do a formal meditation. And for that, I use technology, which we haven't talked about, I, like neurofeedback, neuro meditation, mm. and leveraging all this tech to improve your states deeper states of meditation getting into deeper states in a very systematic way mm. using kind of tech toys which is nowadays fascinating what you can do but those are all more formal meditation state they help you get deeper level of or altered state of consciousness mm. which is cool i mean if you're in these yeah. deep states um, they're kind of fun <laughs> uh, but um on the other hand, they take you out of the real world, right? Because yeah. at that point, you're sitting there meditating. And on the other hand, you're here to get some stuff done. That's my philosophy, right? Some doing yeah. is important as well. And yeah. so that's why you can't <laughs> sit in, in meditation all day long. So the idea is make the whole day your meditation by being into this ultimate state of flow the whole day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's nothing prevents you from setting aside 10, 20 minutes or 30, 40 minutes per day for doing formal meditation. And yes, if you use some of the tech, you just make faster progress. I think this is the key thing. I, I went to, I'll give you an example. I went uh, two years ago to Dave Asprey's uh, 40 Years of Zen program, which is also on the West Coast. And uh, it's like one week. I'm not sure if you heard about it, but yeah. it's it's but you can week. explain. <laughs> it's basically one week where you immersed into pretty much uh, latest tech around neurofeedback, neuro meditation. You arrive there in the morning and then the whole day you sit in this pot and meditate. And then, of course, you have work to do to upgrade your mind. And this is exhausting stuff. Mm. Uh, after the second day, I, I felt like I, 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 I need to head home. This was too much. Mm. I did another day. This was when I reached my ultimate low. But I figured usually it is exactly like this. The mind doesn't like this. So I figured let's just do it and we get through this. And then all of this, you get this turnaround point, right? And after a week, you definitely sense something has changed or something has shifted. Wow. But otherwise, people in the past, I mean, this is what, of course, also the marketing tells you, which at the end of the day, the, the gist of it, there, there is a point to this that other people, of course, can spend thousands of hours in meditation, formal meditation. But why would I if there is technology available yeah. that makes it easier? So you get a shortcut here if you know how to leverage this type, type of technology. And fortunately, a lot of these uh, neurofeedback devices and practitioners become now more widely available the equipment is becoming less expensive. Mm. And so it will be offered by more uh, locations that mm. you can just use it and take advantage of it. So if if you're up for something like this, I definitely can highly recommend it. Is that something that you do in your private work with people or you send someone, send people to, to something like this to go do it? Or, you know, how do people get access to these types of technology? Yeah, I mean, here in my in my location here in, in Germany, I'm living here near Frankfurt in the countryside. I uh, I have a lot of this stuff available. And for neurofeedback, I work with a friend of mine in Berlin. Mm. He's a deep a neurofeedback expert. And so I collaborate with him on these things and becomes 
possibly down here and we're doing a few sessions, but I'm also uh, trying to get more and more of these devices here up and running and make nice. them available. So it is something because if you want to talk about upgrade mind and body for the mind, this is one of the most effective ways of doing it. Of course, you have still have to do the basics. So I'm not right, so right. tracking what I'm talking about, really going to the gist of awareness. Debugging You're going to get all the yogis mad. <laughs> all to do this stuff as well, but then you can add in and sprinkle in a little bit of technology that right. helps the simplified tracking, but also use it for some of the more advanced brain type of uh, work. Mm with neurofeedback, and this is uh, where you get like some shortcuts. Mm. Last thing I want to hit on is, you know, you specialize in micronutrients and talk about upgrading the body to help you be more in alignment. Could you uh, share with us your thoughts on that? We hit about hit it a little bit with, you know, epigenetics talk and how you can change your gene expression through the choices that you're making. But, you know, in terms of micronutrients, how do you see that play into mindfulness? Yeah, actually a lot um, uh, this was my interest when I when I figured that my nutrition is completely suboptimal. Uh, that's what I learned 10 years ago. And then when I arrived at, in Berlin about seven, eight years ago, I uh, ran into some functional medicine uh, doctors. Nice. And there, this was when I, I've, I noticed all of a sudden, oh, wow. Uh, there's all these different supplements, micronutrients, what are they doing and how are they affecting my body and biology? Mm. So I got deep into, uh, is my mind is like this, I'm good at absorbing stuff yeah. and go into, and pretty much as an engineer, right? you, you go into, absorb it, make sense out of it, apply right. it. And right. then I realized this is this is basically the, the brain, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, is the hardware. And so a healthy brain needs building blocks, materials, right. of minerals, trace elements, cofactors, right. vitamins. Right. Uh, but at the end of the day, yeah, it needs also, of course, proteins, amino acids, and all that stuff. It needs these building blocks to, at the end of the day, from them, build these neurotransmitters, but also break them down. Right. And of course, there is, you can use then these supplements, but you have to know what you're doing because this is also a very complex field. There is poor quality, then there is, mm -hmm. it's not as easy as just throw everything in and see what happens. Right. Be, you have to have the right balance. You have high uh, basically a high level of bioavailability that the body actually can absorb it mm -hmm. to figure out, yeah, what brands work out well, how to combine all that stuff. And how can you actually come up with a routine of micronutrients every day that serves you well? Mm -hmm. And if you do that properly, then uh, specifically when we talk about mindfulness, it's important that the brain and neurotransmitters function very well. And energy is also very important that you have sufficient energy. There we go into mitochondria, right? So if your cells cannot produce sufficient energy level, how can you even meditate? Right. It's not working. So you need a lot of energy. That means the brain has so in, in the brain cells and the neuron, neurons, mm -hmm. the uh, amount of mitochondria per cell is particularly dense. They need So therefore they need to to have a lot of these uh, micronutrients in mm -hmm. these dosages. To give you an example, magnesium. This is <laughs> I was going to talk about magnesium too. <laughs> a look thing, right? Because when I, I, I check here clients, when they come into my epigenetic lab here, biohacking lab, mm -hmm. and I do measurement on magnesium. So I have this uh, laser spectronomy tool that you can use to uh, take a picture of the tissue and that tells you exactly what all the mineral levels are, what so basically what's in the cells actually, and then um, also what the the amount of toxins, heavy metals as, as well. So you can see that very quickly with one simple measurement. It's very precise. And magnesium, this is my tip here. I think is always deficient. I haven't seen one client so far yet 
mm-hmm. that have really strong uh, magnesium levels. So usually it's always on the mm-hmm. on the low side of things, on the deficient side of things. But mm-hmm. magnesium is so important; it drives more than three, four hundred gene expressions. But it's also important for energy production. Right. So that's why you need lots of it. Right? Mm-hmm. But of course, supplementing it again gets more tricky. You have mm-hmm. to know okay what types of magnesium, mm-hmm. how much, when, and so on. So mm-hmm. fortunately, there is good podcasts out there that talk about it, and I have a lot of this information on my blog, themindfulleader.net, mm-hmm. because magnesium. Yep is so important Mm -hmm. i dedicate some of these um, some of these supplements that are important for brain health Mm -hmm. as well basically yeah i was thinking magnesium as well because um a friend of mine has a mineral company it's like a nano particle size mineral company and when i met him he ran a test on me and i my magnesium to this day was the most efficient of anyone i've seen and i was taking magnesium um, not super, not every single day, but you know, pretty regularly, but I wasn't absorbing it. And I had just gone through a massive amount of life trauma, like unbelievable stress on top of it. I was keto and training hard and, you know, it was just like a recipe for magnesium deficiency. And when I got my levels back up, I'm, I, I didn't realize how bad I had anxiety until I got my magnesium levels restored. And it was like, just such an overwhelming sense of calm, you know? And so, yeah, in terms of mindfulness, if you're magnesium deficient, it's just the anxiety, the racing thoughts, it's very hard to be present when you don't have adequate minerals. And like you said, certain vitamins are, you know, cofactors for these processes in our brain and our bodies and our methylation cycle. And if you don't have them, it makes it hard to be present when your body's under this constant threat state of like, I'm, I don't have everything I need, you know? And so, um, yeah, it is really, really important and life-changing and the way our soils are, as I hope everybody knows, you know, I actually went to a regenerative farm in Ohio here in the States where they test the mineral content of their plants. And then they buy ones from the grocery store. And I watched their scientists present on like, here's how much, here's how many, um, what percent of minerals were in the stuff from the store and ours, you know, cause they're really testing that. And I couldn't believe it. I mean, some of the minerals were just missing altogether, but they were all drastically lower, you know, and it's pretty hard. I mean, maybe Germany's better than the States. <laughs> I feel like pretty almost everywhere is better than the States, yeah, but our soils are bad. So supplementing is most likely necessary at this point. There's so many studies out there. They did these these uh, these tests now for decades. You can see comparison between 30 years ago, 10 years ago now, and you see sometimes 60, 70, 80% drop in some of these uh, minerals. Mm-hmm. It's, it's clear, right? Without supplement, it's no debate. I mean, there is this is a fact by now. Right. Uh, people just need to look at the facts, what they are, right? And that means supplementation is important. And maybe the last thing I may add here is uh, what you said earlier with magnesium. It's hard to get these levels up, but what I learned, the trick, so this is the insider tip here, <laughs> the, mm-hmm. the liposomal form of magnesium. So if you yeah. find liposomal right. form of magnesium, and here in Germany, there's a good brand, they have it, and it tastes a little bit like basil, like mm-hmm. a little bit this peppermint thing, right? Mm-hmm. And um, it's a good taste, and that is what doing really the trick. Because for me, similar thing, it took me two years, and mm-hmm. it weren't changing. I did my measurements in the tissue, and pretty much they kept like this, and I would take seven, 800 milligrams of magnesium. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm think something needs to needs to change there but the yeah. trick is switching to this uh, liposomal form right that it can directly be uh, absorbed by the cells mm-hmm. it's not that bad within a month or two yeah those level up and then i think meditation also is a different experience at that point yeah. Yeah. That's what my, my friend from up, his company is called upgraded formulas. My people probably know about it because they've heard me talk about it a lot, but yeah, it's um, I think that the particle size of the minerals, a lot of these, you know, just magnesium glycinate that you randomly pick up at the store. I think the particle size is too big to absorb for most people. So 
That's a great tip. It's like, it's gotta be nano liposomal, something that you can directly yeah. absorb. Cause I'm yeah. Magnesium deficiency is like unbelievably high. And I just want to highlight for anybody listening, like, like you said, it's important to test because you might not need certain minerals, but you might need like manganese, like crazy, you know, you don't know, or you, you know, you don't know if you have heavy metals unless you test, you know, so testing is important. Um, it's awesome that we can do that now, you know, that wasn't accessible to humans a few hundred years ago, even a couple hundred, even a hundred really. It, yeah. Even a hundred years ago, that wasn't accessible. So how lucky are we that we can find out and it's pretty affordable. So, um, okay. Let's d- direct people to the right place to go. So your website is the mindfulleader.net, and you did create that 12 week program. So that's anybody who wants to get in on everything you were describing of like how to actually do this, how to measure mindfulness and all of your teachings is in that. Yeah, it's all there. The high performance mind program it comes in different flavors and there's always something that usually resonates with people and say, ah, this is a good fit, and then go from there. Awesome. Thank you. And then you also do have um, mentoring and coaching, correct? And um, work with you work with organizations as well? Yeah, yeah. Okay. This is a good thing that nowadays there is even more awareness in the business world and of the of the need to do some smart stuff with, with data and well-being and how mental health and how this all can be brought together. And so that's why I'm currently working with two companies on a pilot, one actually on the West Coast and one here in Germany. Mm. Coast, right? But I think it's a good thing that uh, companies are definitely open for those type of things. And uh, yeah, I think we need more people mm. on these lines of work, what we're doing here to to support and, and help. Right? Raising, yeah. raising awareness, raising consciousness on on a broader level in the business world, especially. Yeah, no, it's such important work. It's like, I love how you t- called it, like um, like having a deeper experience. I think that's how you said it, having a deeper experience of life. Like that's that's it. That's a great way of putting it. It's just like, I don't, I, I don't think that, at least for me, I guess I'm, I can only speak from my own experience. It's just like the more conscious and aware, the more aware I become, the more I'm like, God, I was like a robot before I didn't realize I I was so asleep. And that's just coming into this presence of what you're teaching people to do. It's like your life becomes more in color. Everything becomes more ease. Everything becomes more fulfilling. So it's really important work. So thank you for showing up to the table and bringing all your cool engineer skills to the table. Um, We'll link up uh, the mindfulleader.net in the show notes guys. And then also um, you can find him on Instagram as the mind at the mindful leader. So Reiner, thank you so much for joining us all the way over from Germany. I'm sure it's late there. So I appreciate you taking the time. Thanks Sarah for having me. It was fun.